Zechariah chapter 4. Notes are there for you on you version. I don't know what happened last week, but it was down. But it's back up. So the notes are there for you. Zechariah chapter 4. Can we begin reading with verse 1? Then the angel who was speaking with me, me referring to the prophet Zechariah, returned and roused me as a man who is aroused from his sleep. He said to me, what do you see? Zechariah replied, I see and behold a lampstand of all gold with its bowls on the top of it. And it's seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also, two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Father, Open our hearts to receive by faith your word. That your word may be profitable within us. And Lord, it may be profitable as it works through us by faith. In testimony to the lost. Encouragement to our fellow believer. And in God, the continual building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Little history. Zerubbabel was a descendant of David, and he was appointed to be leader of the Jews who returned to Jerusalem from the exile in Babylonian captivity. We find this information in 1 Chronicles 3:19, as well as in Ezra 2 and verse 2. And in this time, we find that there has been approximately 75 years that have passed. 75 years that have passed since the prophet Habakkuk and Jeremiah predicted the invasion of Judah by King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon invaded and conquered Judah because of their rebellion against God. They went their own way, living in their own desires, which were sinful in what they were doing and worshiping other gods' images instead of worshiping and being true and obedient to the one true God that delivered them out of Egypt and gave them a land of their own. And because of that, God punished them. But before he punished them, he warned them time after time after time after time. That now over 75 years have passed. God's judgment is complete. And he has moved the Persian king Cyrus, who has conquered the Babylonian empire, moved his heart to allow those who were willing from the captive Jewish people to return to their homeland and rebuild the temple and the city of Jerusalem. Before God sent them into exile, he told them that he would call them back. When his judgment was complete. God, an individual in his word, did just that. Isaiah 44, 28. Before, years before any of the uh, conquering of Judah and all took place, God spoke through his prophet Isaiah about what would take place through the king of Persia, Cyrus. Isaiah 44, 28 says, It is I, God says, who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd. And he will carry out all my desires. And he says of Jerusalem, she will be built. Not might, not could, will be. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Zerubbabel, who was the governor chosen by God, not by man, but by God, 
and was commissioned with an incredible task to go back to the ruins of Jerusalem, to the ruins of the city and of the temple, and begin to rebuild. This wasn't man's desire or man's thoughts. This was God's heart and what he had already spoken of. We understand the significance of the temple. The temple was the place where God's glory came down and and dwelled among his people. It was the place under the old covenant where God's spirit dwelt with his people. The temple was the visible sign that the Jews were the chosen people of Yah, of Jehovah, of Yahweh. The rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem was no small endeavor, and it was a task that brought with it difficulties. May we never forget that although we are doing the will of God, that somehow we think there is to be smooth sailing all the way, and if there isn't smooth sailing, something is wrong. Nothing's wrong because the enemy is going to come and oppose us and discourage us from what God has called us to do. And with this task brought about great difficulty. In fact, we find in Ezra 3.3 that the Jews who had returned to rebuild, they felt a dread of the people who were occupying the land at that time. In fact, it says this, They were terrified of the people of the lands. We think about that word terrified. It can also be translated as as dread. Dread is not simply a passing fear, but an intense paralyzing fear of what will or what could happen. How many of you have ever played a scenario out completely in your mind before it ever came to pass? Oh, come on, lift your hands up. You know you've done it, just like me. You play. In fact, Jennifer gets on to me all the time. Would you stop? You're driving me crazy. <laughs> but dread is not just simply a passing fear. It's an intense, paralyzing fear of what will or what could happen. And it is combined with a sense that we are powerless to do anything about it. And most times when we dread something... I don't know about you, but I just want to put it out of my mind and not think about it. But it's like anchored there, and every time I try to throw it away, it just seems to come back. We're trying to put it out of our mind, but yet there is that constant gnawing in our stomach, in the pit of our stomach. There is that tension in our shoulders, and a feeling of something bad is on the horizon And possibly with this word that is given to us in Ezra 3.3, possibly this is how Zerubbabel and the children of Israel felt about their neighbors who were around them. But we understand from God's word that it is precisely in these situations that God calls us to trust him. When we don't see, when we don't know, and when we don't understand, God says what? Trust me. Trust me. And facing the fact that these nations were far more numerous and far more powerful than they were as exiled Jewish people, Zerubbabel put his trust in the Lord. How do we know this? Because as we read through Ezra 3, going back up to verse 2 and through the remainder of verse 3, we find that Zerubbabel put his trust in God because what did they do? Because there was dread in their hearts, because the people were numerous, because they were more powerful what is the first thing they did when they got to Jerusalem the Bible says that Zerubbabel led the people in building an altar to the Lord and began to lead them in worship (coughs) worship there is something amazing about worship yes it is about God but the more we focus the more we sing the more we remind ourselves of who He is, everything around us begins to get dim. Ezra 3, verses 2 and 3, Then Joshua the son of Jehozadak, and his brothers the priest, and Zerubbabel the son of Shethiel, and his brothers rose up and built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. 
So they set up the altar on its foundations because they were terrified of these peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burning offerings morning and evening. Worship. Worship. I've found one of the greatest remedies in my life for fear, one of the greatest remedies in my life for dread as a child of God, as a child of God, as a born-again believer. One of the things that restores faith and encourages faith, it grows faith, is worship. Worship. And as we continue to read the story, Ezra tells us that the foundations, through that dedication, they observed the Feast of Booths, and they observed the festivals unto the Lord. That was worship to the Lord. The Bible tells us soon after that they finished the foundation of the temple. And when they had finished laying the foundation, the people took time to stop and to thank the Lord for his favor because they realized it's not through their ability that they were able to do this to this point. It was through God's. But you know what? Even though they took time to stop and worship the Lord, this didn't discourage the enemy. Now, we get discouraged, but I don't, the enemy never gets discouraged. Do you ever see that? He knows what his end is. And just because we serve God, just because we press in, just because we're obedient, the devil doesn't, and hell doesn't just throw up its hands and say, oh, well, they're a lost cause. Let me move on to somebody else. No, he presses in even more, doesn't he? And that's what we find in the story. It didn't discourage the enemy at all. He was persistent in moving against the people of God for the purpose of disheartening and distracting them from God's will. Ezra 4, verses 4 through 5, tells us this. Then the people of the land, those numerous people that... When they got to the land, they had dread over. These people discouraged the exiles, the people of God, and frightened them from building and bribed advisors against them to frustrate their advice all the days of King Cyrus of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The enemy did things to frighten, frighten the Jews, making them distracted. And if you know the story, and if you don't, I encourage you to read it in Ezra. You can read it in Haggai. You can read it in Zechariah. But through the enemy's tactic, he distracted the people of God with their own belongings instead of what belonged to God. Don't you know the enemy can use good things to keep us from the great things of God? The enemy can use the good things of even serving in the church to keep us from the great things that God wants to do in and through our lives. I'm not speaking against serving in the church, but it's not just about the good things. We can become distracted. We can become satisfied. And we find in the story here, and I'll let you do the digging, and as you do the digging in Ezra, and you do the digging in Haggai, you will find the people got distracted with good things, which was taking care of their family and building their panel houses, and they left the work of God. They were caught up in the trap of discouragement. Things were not going as expected. They had come to a complete standstill at this point. They had left the work of the temple and they began to work on their own homes. In fact, they had gotten comfortable with the fact that the temple of the Lord was not being built. And the work on the temple lay dormant for over 10 years. Can we not become comfortable with good things? You know, it doesn't cost me as much. Uh, just these good things. I, I do enough good things that I can feel okay about myself. But what about the great things God has called us to? In fact, didn't Jesus say greater things that you will do <coughs> in my name 
and my authority. I don't want to be satisfied with good. I don't want to be satisfied with, you know, it's good enough. No, I want to be satisfied and continually filled with the greatness of God and the greatness that He is calling me to for His glory and for the advancement of His kingdom. We can do good things and stay under the radar, right? Stay under the radar from the enemy and stay under the radar from our society. I don't want to rile anybody up. I, in fact, the Bible, doesn't it tell me to live at peace with all men as it pertains to me? So I'll just do these few good things. But what about the great things that God is calling us to? And they had become distracted with that, become comfortable with worrying about their things instead of God's things. But thank God in His faithfulness. Thank God in His faithfulness. He stirred His people and He called to them. Over 10 years it lay dormant. And to call His people back to the work of His house, the Lord raised up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. And I love what Zechariah's name means. Zechariah's name means Yahweh remembers. God doesn't forget. And in Ezra 5.1, we're told that God used both the prophets to stir up the Jews to begin work again and complete the building of the temple. Hang with me. I hadn't said that in a long time, so I needed to throw that in there. Hang with me. And God speaks directly to Zerubbabel. Through the prophet Zechariah. And he tells the rubble, well, as we've already read this morning, that this work, this great work will be built by him, but it will not be through his strength. It will not be through the strength of the people. It will come about not by might nor by power, but by God's Spirit. That's his word. And his word is true. I love what Second Chronicles 16 and verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. God is looking for individuals that will say, God, I'm not just satisfied with the good. Lord, I want you to work in and through my life to accomplish the great things for the kingdom that you have called and established through your son to be accomplished. He's looking. He's looking, in fact, in January. Do you guys remember the word of the Lord that was given? Through tongues and interpretations, do y'all remember? The Lord distinctly says, I'm looking for individuals. I'm looking for a remnant. I'm looking for people who will stand up and say, God, I'm done with the good things. Lord, I want to be focused on the greatness of your will, the great things you are calling me to. And those great things are not diminished, and God, they're not thrown down simply because of what's going on in Washington, what's going on with the politicians, what's going on in our economy, what's going on around the world. Those circumstances mean nothing. And Lord, I want to lose my focus on those things and place my focus on you because I know you're looking for a vessel that will be yielded to the great things you want to do. The purpose of the vision was to encourage Zerubbabel to complete the rebuilding of the temple and to assure him of the enablement of God's Spirit. Zerubbabel, you're not going to do it in yourself. You're not going to do it in yourself. The devil will try to frighten us, does he not? It's like being in the church at midnight when it's dark. You think somebody's just hiding around the corner ready to get you. He wants to frighten us. He wants to devour us. He wants to distract us from good things, with good things. And the devil knows that if he can discourage us, then we'll become useless in that moment for God's kingdom. 
Because discouragement shackles our vision. Fear shackles our vision. God's vision. Doing what He has called us to do. The great things He has called us to do. Notice that the devil uses the same tactic. Fear. Fear. He wants to frighten us with a lack of faith and trust in the Lord and who He is and unbelief. He knows that fear shackles and can control our minds and our hearts. But you know what? The world's saying a lot of things. The enemy says a lot of things. Our flesh even screams at us, doesn't it? But you know what? What is God saying? What is He saying and what has He said? 2 Timothy 1, 7, Timothy is rem- or Paul is reminding the young Timothy at the end of his life, he reminds Timothy, God has not given his children a spirit of fear, but he has given them power, his power. He has given them his love. He has given us sound and disciplined mind. And as we read on through the story, as God brings His children back to focus upon Him and to the call that He had given them, pick the story back up in Zechariah 4 with verse 7. And notice what God says to Zerubbabel and through Zerubbabel to the people. God says, what are you, O great mountains? Before Zerubbabel, who will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Also the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Notice what God says. Notice what he says here to Zerubbabel and what he says to us as his children. Faith in the power of God's Spirit overcomes mountainous obstacles. What are you, O mountain, before my servant? Let that sink in. Come on, let the Lord allow that to sink into our spirit this morning. What are you, O mountain, before my servant who is walking out my call? God, through His Spirit working in us, reduces the mountain, that that seems insurmountable, to level ground. Level ground. Difficulties that seem as large as a mountain are not overcome by our strength. It's not overcome by our ability. So we need to stop thinking, well, God, I just don't have the talent. Lord, I just don't have the means to do. God does not call us according to our talents. He calls us according to our availability. And then He will give us the ability we need to do what He's called us to do. In fact, isn't that what God has done? You avail yourself to me, and then I will bring the power and the ability to you. Jesus told the disciples, go to the upper room, and you wait. You wait after he had given them the commission to go into all the world and proclaim the good news of the gospel of Christ, baptizing individuals in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, setting the captive free, healing those who were sick, delivering those who are oppressed or possessed by the devil. He says, you go and you wait because I'm bringing the power to you. I'm bringing the power to you. And that's what the Lord has spoken here. When you come to me, God says, I'll bring the power to you. I love what Ephesians 3, 20, 21, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, God's power 
We are not weaklings. Come on, hear what God's Word says. Not what I say, but hear what God's Word says to you as a child of God. You are not a weakling. Don't act like a weakling because you're not a weakling. The power of God is within you. And Paul says now to him who is able to do exceedingly and above anything, above anything I could ever ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. In other words, it's settled. It's settled. Opportunities with God for the kingdom of God, for his kingdom will, are often disguised as impossibilities with man. Opportunities with God are often disguised as something that is impossible with man. In fact, we can say it this way, God makes big things small. Have you heard that? I know you have. God makes big things small. But notice, not only does he make big things small, God also makes small things big. Read verse 10. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the earth. So there is a question that is posed by the Lord. The question implies that some of the people, as we read the story, have a negative attitude toward this rebuild of the temple. And in the context, the day of small things, as we've read here in, in, in Zechariah 4 and verse 10, it refers to the day of beginning the work on the temple and now continuing it. Because some individuals who were old enough to remember what Solomon's temple looked like, some of them thought it was insignificant compared to the glory of Solomon's temple. And they were so few in number compared to those who were living around them. In fact, Haggai 2, 3 says, Who of you is left who saw this temple in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Or Ezra 3, verses 12 and 13, But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud voice, and the sound was heard afar off. In their minds, this seems so insignificant. It seems so small compared to what was with Solomon's temple. But we understand what the song says, little is much when God is in it. Little is much. I'm not diminishing the temple because it wasn't about the stones. It wasn't about the timber. It was about the glory and the power of God with His people. That God had basically did what He said He would do. He brought His people back. And God says, I'm going to use this remnant to not just bless the Israelites, but I'm going to do a work that is far greater than you could ever imagine. It is going to be a work that is going to bless every tongue, every nation, every tribe, because it is through this temple that Christ will come and be dedicated and sacrifice for our sins. Little is much when God is in it. God was definitely in this rebuild project. Some among the exiles, they thought that the work on the temple was not as important as the musicians come back because it did not match what they had seen. However, nothing that God does 
Nothing that is done with His blessing and nothing that is done in the power of His Spirit is unimportant. Because God's work has eternal value and meaning. Let us get our eyes off the natural and allow God to show us. Let's get our eyes off the natural and let God increase our vision of what He is doing and what He wants to do. God's work has eternal value and meaning, and we must never think that our lack of ability or our lack of resources will cause God's purposes to fail. From the time of creation and throughout history, God has always done great things by starting with very little. How about David? Little shepherd boy. All he had was a staff and a sling and a few rocks. And God used what was in man's eyes was little to overcome the mountainous man Goliath. Sometimes we feel, Lord, all I have is just a few loaves and a few fish. But if we'll bring to God in obedience what we have, God can feed a multitude. God is not looking for ability. He's looking for availability that just says, Lord, it's not about me. It's about you and it's about your will. I give what I have. Everything to you. Lord, take it and use it for your glory. And God will take what seems like something that is so small and he makes it big and impactful for his kingdom. Small things to make them impactful when we simply just yield what we have to his will. So we were at district council this week. There's one thing, especially in Tuesday, and Tuesday is always the mission service in the morning. And just in that service and what the minister spoke from Tanzania, just the Lord impressed upon my heart the reality, Brian, it's, it's, it's not about just the, the good things. I mean, there's a lot of good things that I have to do as a pastor, but it's about the great thing. What is the great thing? What is it that occupies God's thoughts? It's two words. Two words. And in fact, we find it in Matthew 24. And what's so incredible about that, those stories, is Jesus is talking about the end times, right? What we call the little apocrypha. Hang with me just a few more moments. But God through Christ, opens our eyes and our hearts to that that God considers the great things. And you know what they are? It's the lost things. The things that are lost. The lost coin, right? The lost sheep. The lost son. We can be busy doing great things, and I thank God for the building that we're adding because of just the growth of our families with the kids. But it's not about the building. It's about people. It's about people. That's the great thing. That's the great things. That's the greater ministry God is calling us to. It's about people. And I cannot be distracted by all the things that are going on around me. I can't be distracted by those things, the good things that I need to take care of, that I lose focus on the greatest things. It's people. It's souls. It's lives being transformed by the grace of God. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. I don't know who's going to be in the White House after this year. 
I don't know who's going to be on Capitol Hill after this year. I don't know all of those things, but you know what? It doesn't matter because God is still on His throne. And God is still working in and through His people. Let's not get distracted by all the things. Let's not get distracted by the good things. The Lord had not providentially brought the Jews back from exile simply to see them fail. God would ensure that the work would be accomplished. That's what He has spoken. And as we seek to engage in God's kingdom work in this world, we too must have the words of God to Zechariah ringing in our spirit. It's not by power, nor is it by might. Is by my spirit. Father, Lord, I pray. Lord, move upon our hearts. Lord, work your will. God, work your will. Stir us. Stir us. Stir us, Lord. Stir us. Stir us according to your heart and according to your mind. Can we do that this morning? Can we just stand to our feet? And just where we are, can we lift our voice to the Lord, lift our hearts? If you want to lift your hands, lift your hands to Him and say, Lord, Lord, I'm available. I'm available. You say, well, pastor, we, we pray this continually. You know what? There shouldn't be a day we shouldn't pray this. Lord, I'm available. I'm available for what seems impossible in the natural, but I know it's possible with you. Come on, pray it to him this morning. Lord, stir my heart that I'm not distracted by my things. Away, God, from the greater things from the kingdom. Lord, stir my heart that, Lord, I am not trapped by fear and discouragement from the enemy. But, Lord God, I depend upon the empowerment and the enablement of Holy Spirit toward the greater things of the kingdom. Lord, move us. Lord, move us. Come on, make an altar where you are. Come on, don't just listen to me and pray. Come on, make an altar where you are. Are you really available? Are you really available for the Lord? You, we, I can pray that, but am I really available? Am I really yielded? Am I really surrendered to what God wants to do? Come on, make yourself available. Come on, call out to Him. Call out to Him. Maybe the Lord has been stirring something in your spirit and something in your heart as an, as an individual for the kingdom and you're just saying, Lord, I just don't have the ability. I don't have the means. Stop saying I don't have the ability and just start telling Him, Lord, I'm available. You give me the ability to what you are calling me to do. Come on. Come on. Open up our hearts. Let's open up our hearts to Him. Lord God. Lord God, pour out Pour out, God, of your Spirit. Pour out of your Spirit. Lord, stir our minds. Stir our hearts. Stir our lives toward the great things that, God, you are calling us to. Lord, the great things that pertain to lost things. That when we look in this world and we see the way the world is pressing, Lord, against your truth. The way the world is trying to intimidate. Lord God, we pray that you would, God, fill us with your spirit. God, we pray as they prayed in Acts 4. Lord, give us boldness. God, not hate Lord God, but give us boldness, Lord, to proclaim the truth of the gospel in the spirit of agape love. Oh God, because there are souls at stake. There are lives. There are children. 
There are young people. There are young adults. There are older people, old adults. God, there are families that are at stake. They're at stake. Lord, to be available toward the great things. Toward the great things. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Pour out your heart to Him. Come on, pour out your heart to Him. Lord, I'm available. Lord, I'm available. Lord, I'm available. Here I am. Lord, use me. Lord, use me. Lord, use me. Use me, God. Because I know it's not by my mind, it's not by my power, but it is by your Spirit. It is your Spirit. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Use me. Lord, open our eyes. Open our hearts toward the great things. Toward the great things of your will. Open our hearts individually. Open our hearts as a fellowship of the body of Christ at Ozark First. Open our hearts and our minds toward the great things, God. May there not be a day that passes by that we are not praying toward and availing ourselves toward the great things that, God, you want to do in this community, in and through us. God, stir us. Stir us. Lord, we're available. We're available. We're available. Open our eyes and open our hearts, oh God, we pray. Oh, and Lord, as we're walking, Lord, we're going to depend on your grace. We're going to depend on your grace, which is your ability working in us that enables us to do what we cannot do in ourselves. While we are praying and working toward those greater things, we're going to depend on your grace that is sufficient. It is sufficient. It is your grace that makes big things small and makes small things big. Mm. Come on, let's sing this out again. Come on, 